We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is the first podcast I've done since Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, we reposted a, um, a conversation with uh, Dr. John Huntsman um, a, a little while ago, but that's an old conversation. It was about Russia, it was about much of what's going on, but it wasn't, of course, current. Um, and so now I've had the chance to, of course, digest all these uh, awful events and, um, and get you some of the facts. And so today, we want to talk about this current situation in Ukraine, uh, what led up to this, what Russia wants, who Putin really is, and what we can do about it. And of course, as usual, I bring on an esteemed expert to talk about this. Today, we have Dr. Corey Shockey. Uh, Corey, thanks so much for being on. It's a great pleasure. So a uh, quick bio on you. You're the senior fellow and the director of foreign and defense policy at the American Enterprise Institute. You've held a lot of positions in uh, various places in government, State Department, DOD, National Security Council. Uh, you have taught at Stanford, West Point, Johns Hopkins, University School of Advanced International Studies, National Defense University, and University of Maryland. That's my wife's alma mater. Uh, you've uh, you've published five books and, uh, of course, probably countless articles. Um, people can follow you on Twitter at Corey Shockey. Uh, that's K-O-R-I-S-C-H-A-K-E. All right. Um, let, let's get right to it. What's um, We're over many days into this invasion and uh and, you know there's there's a, there's a few things that are clear this is this is an invasion it is not some act of defense which is putin has tried to propagandize um but where are we right now how are the ukrainians holding up the ukrainians are holding up amazingly well it's been impressive how well their military has fought it's extraordinary how inspiring the government and civil society and average ukrainians have been in the face of oh, this yeah. terror they're brave it's it's energized free societies into action in their defense and that's a really beautiful thing to see um another thing that's surprising is how bad the russian military actually is you know the joke about how amateurs do strategy and professionals do logistics. Yeah, well, it's, it's no joke at all. That the logistics are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's really, I mean, Russian soldiers scrounging for food, tanks running out of gas. They don't appear to have a good sense about how to do combined arm arms operation. Mm -hmm. There, there haven't been able these several days to establish air superiority over the Ukrainians. And uh, they are they are communicating on open comms. They don't have a secure network. Uh, the deficiencies are really striking. Yeah. And I think have been damaging to what Vladimir Putin has thought he was doing, which was a shock and awe campaign that was going to rapidly collapse the government in Kiev and replace it with a Russian friendly one uh, and demonstrate that the American military is not so special. Mm -hmm. And instead, what he has demonstrated is just how good the militaries of the United States and its close allies are by comparison to Russia. Yeah, I would say I would add to that. It, it appears they're not very good at operating at night either, um, which, which yes. is surprising for an advanced military. The communication, you know, look, Putin took a lot of people by surprise. I, I don't think he took some of us by surprise, but but he took a lot of Europeans by surprise. It apparently took his own soldiers by surprise. I mean, you saw that yeah. te those text messages. It, that's not the only reports we've heard of that, of course. You saw those text messages um, read by the um, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN, which was a was a soldier who then later died uh, texting his mother saying, look, I didn't I thought we were going on a on a training mission. And now we're killing civilians, I and mean, it was it was kind of heart wrenching. Um, you've heard very uh, reports of very low morale in the Russian military. Uh, we we'd seen some reports. I don't know how verified these are, but they were from U.S. officials uh, that that in, in this forty mile convoy currently uh, uh, looking to enter Kiev, that uh, some Russian some units within that were giving up without a fight. Russians giving up without yeah. a fight. 
Yeah. So that's that's interesting. Um, you know, what, what do you what do you make of that? What's the mindset of your typical Russian soldier? So 30 percent of the Russian uh, army are conscripts and they have evidently done some uh, forced conversions of conscripts into contract soldiers because they're not supposed to be able to send conscripts outside of Russia. And of course that can't be good for morale. People don't know what they're fighting for. They, you know, so much of Russian rhetoric has been about the Ukrainians are our brothers. They're a natural part Mm. of Russia. And so the cognitive dissonance of we are blowing up apartment buildings to force them to, it doesn't make any sense to soldiers. And of course, as you know, from your service, the the great mul- force multiplier in militaries is people caring enough to run risks. Mm-hmm. And I think what we're seeing is most Russian soldiers, at least in these early days, are not willing to run risks, especially the soldiers who are operating around Kiev. No, I mean, imagine you couldn't get American soldiers to kill Canadians. You just it would just be it just we couldn't wrap our heads around it. And I don't really, there's not that much difference here to be, I, I'm not, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not an expert okay, on that's that a area. Fabulous simile. I hadn't yeah, thought of that. Because honestly, but what's yeah, the that difference? That makes it very concrete. And, um, you know, a couple of other things I would add just from the military perspective, um, and you brought it up, but I want to want to harp on this point a little bit is the communications aspect. Communications mm-hmm. in the military are extremely difficult. Secure communications, unsecure communications that anybody can tap into. That's really easy, um, you know, but but secure communications are very difficult. And so people are like, oh, surprise, like how, how hard can it be? Right. Like I have, um, you know, I have signal. I have the signal app on my phone. I have a phone. Yeah. Like, right. but um, for for the for the kind of things the military needs with radio waves, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a cellular network. Um, it, it is much more difficult. Um, and look, the, Amer- the American military struggled for this for a long time. I mean, the reason we're so good, we're, we're not the same military we were in the year 2000. Uh, we learned a lot. This is, this is a point I've made a lot about the Chinese per se. And I'm a little more surprised about the Russians because they do have experience in Chechnya and Syria, et cetera. Um, not nearly as much experience as the American military has. But the Chinese have no experience. So that, that, you know, I, sometimes I think we overestimate their abilities because they've never really walked through these scenarios. I mean, really, really done it. And so it's it, it just I say that just to explain to people why it's, it doesn't really surprise me why they, they can't do this stuff very well. Yes. Not only can they not do the high level of sophistication stuff well, right, like the integration of air and mobility and infantry um, and cyber, they can't do the basic stuff mm-hmm. very well. And, and you know, war is the only way we learn these things. It unfortunately because, is. Yeah. And so I think the gamble Putin has run has actually really weakened Russia in all sorts of important ways. It's made clear the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. And the Russians are the bad guys. It's demonstrated the weaknesses of the Russian military. I mean, they'd lose a fight. I mean, they're losing a fight against the Ukrainians. Imagine what the Polish military could do to them or the American military. Yeah. And, And the third thing that I think is really significant is the way free societies are mobilizing our civil society, Mm -hmm. you know, the anonymous hackers group going after the Russians and publicizing the personnel lists of the Russian MOD. Really? Um, I hadn't even seen that. The way that, that, yeah, the way that uh, BP has written off a $26 billion investment in Russia because they don't want to be associated with the Russians. Uh, you know, Apple is now no longer allowing Apple Pay to work or Russians to buy Apple products. Wow. They're leaving their messaging system open so that civil society in Russia can pass information. But it's really beautiful to see how much uh, the free exchange of ideas and information in democracies 
um, and the courage of the Ukrainians has mobilized all sorts of voluntary activity to increase the penalties to the Russians for what they're doing. It is good. And it does it does almost give you chills to hear those good stories. Um, in the end, though, it, what's frustrating to me is that in the end, bombs and bullets are the only gonna thing that are going to stop the Russians at this point. I think long term, it's very clearly a loss for Russia. That that seems that wasn't always clear. Seems very clear now because they went too far. Um, mm-hmm. I I I think there was a strategy Putin could have done that would have put us in a more put the West put the world in a more difficult position if he'd just done an incursion into the Donbass region, for instance. It's not what he did. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's going way further than that. So long term loss, but short term, very very big loss for the Ukrainians, and it seems reversible. Uh, you know that that would not have this was not a conversation a lot of us anticipated. But with enough aid, yeah. with enough lethal aid, or with the, with the right kind of aid, you know, and I would, I continue to call on our Europeans' powers to to really push for this, get more active. Um, you can reverse this, and then if you reverse this, that domino effect is unstoppable. China will be looking at that and say, I don't see the, how we could go into Taiwan. I think you are right on both counts. Um, I'm a little more generous to our European friends than you are. I mean. Sweden is sending lethal aid to Ukraine. Norway is sending lethal aid to Ukraine. Um, that 79% of Germans support their government adding $100 billion to the German defense budget this year. Wow. That almost triples the German defense budget. Um, and so, you know, free societies are slow to react. But and and you're right that Europeans have been indulgent for too long about Russia, but everybody gets the message now. You know, Ukraine has been so smart in capitalizing on this moment. They submitted their application for EU membership and the EU has started the process now. So I do think Europeans are scared now and are doing the right things, including giving the lethal weaponry that Ukrainians need to stay in the fight. Your point about China, I think, is really smart. If I were the Chinese national security advisor, I would really be sweating right now. Because four days before this invasion, they made a big show of their treaty of friendship with the Russians. Mm, really? And so they're dragged into culpability on this. Oh, yeah. And I, and, and people point. like me are dragging them in. I mean, I, I always say it's, 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 it's Russia and China. Absolutely. They don't they don't get they don't get to sit on the sidelines here. They they are part of this kind of this this new Absolutely. world order that they're trying to create. And the Chinese government said they weren't going to honor the sanctions that all of the rest of us are putting against. But then they realized their exposure to the kind of secondary sanctions that Congress so enjoys applying. Mm -hmm. And China's now limiting the amount of loans that their own banks can offer to the Russians because they realize there's going to be a second shoe to drop on this. Yeah. Well, can we talk about that Um, EU membership? It's an important affirmation about Congress's important role in this. Yeah, well, that's for sure. and can we talk about that EU membership that you mentioned before I forget? So sure. If, sure. if Ukraine is granted EU membership today, what are some of the implications of that? Uh, well, they won't be, right? The process will take a little while. It will have to be affirmed in all of the EU countries before it kicks in. But several things. First, money would flow in, in in large numbers. They'd be part of the common market. The economic consequences of a war would be greatly buffered by EU membership. Second, you know, we it's entirely possible all of us are going to be pulled into this war before it's over. Uh, EU membership would make Europeans have at least a moral obligation to directly assist Ukraine, because there are common defense provisions in the European treaties. The third thing I think it would do is uh, it would further isolate the Russians because it would open up all sorts of possibilities for reconstruction of Ukraine, I see. right? Because the, the EU's common infrastructure funds 
are going to flow into Ukraine to rebuild airports, to rebuild city centers. And whereas Russia is going to be sitting on the margins of Siberia all by itself. Let's, can we, let's back up in time a little bit and um, give some people some Russia, Ukraine 101. What led up to this in the first place? Was, was Georgia the start? of this you know what's what are some of the implications or what are some of the considerations historically that we need to look at to understand why is why this is happening because again to a lot of americans oh, it's like it's it's like we invaded canada it doesn't it doesn't make sense yeah yeah so um ukraine gained its independence with the collapse of the soviet union in 1991 and britain the united states Russia signed a treaty uh, in which we all committed that if Ukraine gave up the Soviet nuclear weapons that were on its territory, we would commit to their sovereignty and their security. And all, all of the signatories of that agreement are in violation of it. The US for not defending Belarus, Britain for not, excuse me, for not defending Ukraine, uh, Britain for not defending Ukraine and Russia for invading Ukraine. So I think that's the important starting point. We made an obligation that we haven't honored. Second thing I think people should understand is that in 2014, Ukraine, which has been struggling to democratize and has had a lot of corruption and a lot of difficulties you know, all of us struggle to govern over diversity, but there's a large Russian speaking population in the east of the country. And they were trying to become Western. And on the eve of an agreement with the European Union that would help pull them more to the West, that's when Russia invaded and took Crimea and fomented an insurrection in the eastern part of the country among Russian speakers. What is so interesting now is that Russia's behavior since 2014 has really solidified Ukrainian nationality. Even Russian speakers in the East oppose Russia and feel Ukrainian now and are defending their country against Russia's invasion. What Putin imagined is that, you know, they could infiltrate Ukraine, you know, maybe uh, Zelensky gets killed by his own bodyguards because they're Russian agents and you can establish a puppet government and Ukrainians would rise up and want to be Russian. And none of those things has proved true. Putin has been the father of Ukrainian nationality. Well, but let's get inside Putin's mind for a minute. What benefits does he see from, from all of this? I mean, it, are there material benefits or is it more associated with his own ego, his own desire to be the sort of second coming of the czars? Is it just is just, just egotistical imperialism or is it a mix of all? Yes. Of no, I don't think there are really important material advantages. It doesn't for seem Russia. like it. I mean, it seems they like already, all disadvantages. Yes, they already com control the warm water ports um, in Crimea. Ukraine is an enormous grain exporter. But, but Russia doesn't really import that grain. So there aren't real material advantages. The, the place to start understanding what Putin is doing is in 2007, he gives this speech about how the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, mm -hmm. which is insane. Yeah, And since then, you saw the invasion of Georgia. You saw the invasion of Ukraine. You saw the wars in Chechnya. Um, excuse me, the wars in Chechnya predate. But you can see the continuum of Russia trying to grab back by force what peoples of the former Soviet Union claimed for themselves at the end of the Cold War, which is sovereignty and political independence. What about the claims, and they, they come from many commentators in our own country, um, the, the claim that, look, Russia's just doing what you would expect them to do if NATO get, it's continue, NATO's in, continue to increase in membership, get closer and closer to Russia, um, some of NATO countries, or, anyway. 
And, um, yeah. and you know, this the, you, you, Ukraine, not closing the door to Ukraine uh, for NATO membership. This is this has escalated it. This is this has provoked Russia. What's what's your counter argument to that? Or are they right? Yeah, no, they're definitely not right. Okay. Um, and the the counter argument is that what the people of Ukraine are suffering right now, the Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, and Romania would be suffering if we hadn't permitted them to come into NATO. Mm -hmm. NATO didn't expand. Countries that feared Russian aggression pleaded for admission to a defensive alliance. Yeah. NATO doesn't conquer any place. NATO protects free societies. And since 1991, you know, I, I was the NATO desk officer and the joint staff uh, at the end of the Cold War. And so did a lot of work on uh, NATO after the Cold War and how to handle the Russians. And I originally did not favor NATO expansion. I thought we could persuade the Russians that they have an interest in stability and prosperity on their borders and in their own country. And it was clear really early on that that's not what Russia wants for itself. That's not what the Russian government wants for itself. Mm -hmm. And so agreeing to protect countries that deserve it, like the Baltic states and Poland and Hungary and Romania, um, is the best defense against Russian aggression. We're responding to Russian aggression. We're not provoking it. Yeah, and it's... You know, I, I try to break it down in simpler terms for people to, having this discussion because there's a lot of people, um, some disingenuously asking, but some genuinely asking, uh, why do we care? All right, why, why does it bother mm -hmm. us? And um, and it's 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 not it's not perfectly easy to explain that to people. I mean, you know, first of all, in NATO expansion, I say, would you you have a room full of people that you don't trust? Would you rather have more allies or less allies? All right, let's let's keep it very let's make it very simple. Um, you're stuck in a room with people you can't possibly necessarily trust. Um, second of all, do you think it makes you stronger or weaker to watch your friend get beat up by somebody else while you sit there and sip your beer? You know, and and that's a it, great <laughs> analogy, right? And it's like, the, and you got to put it into into human because people understand basic human relationships. People understand a bar fight with your friends. Um, and I hate to reduce complicated world affairs to that, but it, it does matter. And the other thing I say to people is it, it's, yeah, I, I get that it's thousands of miles away. Well, Los Angeles is thousands of miles away from New York. <laughs> Do these things affect each other? Damn right. They affect each other. It's a small world we live in. Um, you know, we our supply chains are international. Our shipping lanes are all international. Um, there were, we, oil is spiking, which spikes the price of everything because of, of, of too much dependence on Russia worldwide. Not really the U.S. It's a bit of a myth, but to Europe for, sh for sure. And then you look at the ripple effects. Taiwan, um, they make chips. You know, and people are like, oh, well, what, you can't live without an iPhone? Well, no, you can't. But <laughs> forget iPhones. What about MRIs? What about medical devices that save your life? Um, that what about traffic use? stoplights? Oh, geez. Yeah. I mean, it's just the most basic stuff. Um, yeah. You think this stuff doesn't affect you. It does. Does it mean waste the lives of Marines on, on just whatever endeavor? It absolutely does not. And it's not clear that we have to do that here. That'd be kind of an interesting discussion. Um, but there's 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 definitely a wing of the Republican Party. There's a wing of the Democrat Party um, that that have created this this red herring argument where they're fighting against these warmongers, people trying to send troops in. Nobody's saying that. Um, and it's 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 unfortunately diminishing the national conversation. So anyway, I've rambled on for a bit about my arguments. I'd like to hear your thoughts on just how we have that conversation. I think those are fabulous arguments to make. Right. Um, they the challenge with national security policy is that the United States, for the most part, is so safe from international aggression. We have such a wide margin of error because we have fabulous neighbors um, that it's hard to make it real for people. So I really like the bar fight analogy. Are you, you know, are you safer if your buddy gets beat up in a bar? Um, and do you think you're not going to be get beat up subsequently? Right. Um, 
We, we, and, and we have history to look back on on that. People are like, no, they're across an ocean. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> you think Hitler would have stopped if we hadn't stopped him? You know, because everybody thought this right. from Chamberlain on. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's right. If you look at Franklin Delano Roosevelt's strategy for fighting World War II, I mean, the first thing to appreciate is that we got attacked in the Pacific and we had a Europe first strategy. And the reason was because uh, Franklin Roosevelt understood that if either Britain or the Soviet Union capitulated to Hitler, there was no combination of allies strong enough to make the United States safe in the aftermath. So you're exactly right. I mean, America has been safe because we deal with problems as they are developing and we stop um, predatory behavior early on before it takes on the dimensions that it's an enormous threat to the United States. You wanna deal with problems before they require 10 million American men under arms the way World War II did. Yeah, and I don't, I've never seen a, a, maybe you have, you've been in this business a long time. Um, have you seen an in-depth analysis of you know what would have happened, how history could have been different if America had intervened when France, before, before France had fallen, for instance? Um, you know, their costs have been less. And, uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Um, and, and disingenuous people can make disingenuous claims about what would have happened or what wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have done this or had done this. But it's certainly worth thinking about. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people, including in our own political party, who think the United States should be less engaged in the world. We shouldn't use military force as often. We shouldn't make security guarantees to other countries. And the rebuttal to that is always, that was American foreign policy in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And it works when there aren't dangers in the international order. But allowing your friends to get picked off one by one in that bar fight, yeah. and then you're all alone when you have to deal with it. Um, and, and you think, and you think strategy, right? And you think Central American countries aren't susceptible to to communism? We know they are for a fact because it's been a problem for decades. Uh, so you know, and, and the other thing I maybe frame it this way to to America: Look, Russia, China, they want the new world order. They want this sort of it's like an extreme version of the Great Reset, maybe, right? It's like this this yeah. sort of this mercantilist authoritarian control um, with some free market elements, but, you know, the, the China model, but they want to internationalize it. Um, maybe they don't want exactly the same thing. Russia just wants an oligarchy that's where they, their, their elites can be rich and they want power. But in the end, it's, it's this new world order that is not the Western order. And what America fundamentally wants, whether, frankly, I think, whether you're Democrat or Republican, you want the conservative vision for the world, okay. free markets, free choice, um, free elections, et cetera. And, and, and the thing I would say to people is if you're the only conservative in your neighborhood and everybody else is a far leftist, well, guess what? Then you live in a far leftist world. You don't get to say, well, my house is conservative. It doesn't work <laughs> that way because everybody else is controlling everything around you in your neighborhood. And our world is indeed a neighborhood and you, you can't let that influence creep and it and they are trying to impose it i think that's exactly right you know people very often when we talk about the international order they think it was dreamt up by lefty college professors in the faculty lounge and in fact it was built by the hard men who had fought world war one and world war two and wanted a more stable order that benefited free societies that had agreed rules where everybody contributed to positive outcomes. That is the order that we built in the aftermath of World War II. And you're exactly right that Russia and China are trying to flip the tables over and say, there are no rules. We're strong enough to do whatever we want. Your values aren't our values. Your values aren't universal. Um, and in fact, they're wrong about all of those things. You know, defending human dignity, expanding economic opportunity and making the world a freer and safer place are what American foreign policy is about. And that's what Russia and China are trying to overturn.
I only want to say one more thing about my other question of, um, you know, uh, Russia's fears of NATO and whether those are, are justified or not. I, I would tell people this. Uh, I've never seen an example where Russia is doing a defensive exercise, a military exercise. They're always they're they're off. They're almost always offensive. I mean, they practice bombing Stockholm. You know, I mean, it's right. it is the kind of right. things they do. Um, and, you know, people don't realize that like they, they were never scared of NATO invading Russia. Right. I mean, were they is that ever something that the Kremlin actually considered? They get in their war room and say, guys, I'm really worried about NATO invading. I mean, I'm really worried. But do they ever actually <laughs> believe that? I don't think they would have reason to, right? Like, imagine that conversation in Brussels where we say to the other 29 countries of, of NATO, and soon actually Finland and Sweden are likely to be NATO members too, again, mm -hmm. in response to Russia's aggression. Yeah. So it's not NATO gobbling up other countries. It's Finland and Sweden, so afraid that what Russia has just done in Ukraine, they could do in Sweden or Finland, and wanting the protection of having friends in the room. So try and imagine, you know, we couldn't get NATO allies to agree to support the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get them to agree to invade Russia when yeah. Russia has the ability to use nuclear weapons against any of their countries? And in fact, Vladimir Putin threatened that very thing in the last few days. Do you think um, if, if you were advising the president right now and uh, he was, uh, and this isn't happening, just to be clear, because a lot of people, again, create, <laughs> create, the, create this red herring. But if, if, if the president or any, any European leader was considering a, attempting to invoke Article 5 or get NATO on a war path to Russia, would that even be strategically a good idea at this point? Or what it gives, because uh, one of the considerations no. I have is 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 that it gives Putin what he wants, right? It allows him to rally his domestic support, which is right yeah. now is faltering. I think that's right, Congressman. You know, NATO's Article Five uh, requires its members to consult each other if one of them has been attacked. It is a fundamentally defensive alliance. To invoke Article Five means a NATO country has been attacked. So it would never happen that we get together to decide to invade Russia unless Russia had already invaded one of us. It is a fundamentally defensive alliance. I do worry that, that Russia's aggression could drag us to that point eventually. Um, you know, I, I think it's likelier than not that freedom fighters from around the world are gonna be flowing in to help defend Ukraine and trying to you know, attack Russian units and maybe then retreat to safe harbor in a NATO country. Interesting. I could and, see. And then you could see Russians retaliating yep. and, and such. That's an interesting. Or Russia story. trying to attack the convoys that are delivering arms into Ukraine. Right. And then you, so have, then you have the decision to make. There are a lot of ways this could go bad. But I think it's really important that we not fear that so much that we allow Russia to get the gains of just having threatened it. Mm -hmm. We actually need to shoulder those burdens. And, well, let's talk about the next few days. What what can uh, Ukrainians expect in the next few days? This this convoy you're seeing going into Kiev. Um, you know what? It, how is it going to be? I wonder what their tactics are. I wonder what their strategy will be. And and then what? I mean, you know, let, let's say they do bring the Ukrainian military to its knees in the near term. Um, you know, it's at it, it first you would have said that's inevitable. Um, I, I still wouldn't bet on them, unfortunately, but they're looking much better than every, every, everyone expected. Yeah. So, you know, it's, or anything is possible. But let's say that they are brought to their knees. I mean, I'm not even sure what Russia, what is Russia even doing with Ukraine? You're going to have an insurgency on your hands, clearly, at this point. Absolutely right. And you probably saw the video of that Ukrainian woman handing out packets of sunflower seeds to Russian soldiers and saying, so that flowers grow out of your decomposing corpse after yeah. we kill you. <laughs> like, great. This is not a country that's going to have it, that they're going to have an easy time occupying. Uh, what it looks to me like the Russians are trying to do is surround Kiev, maybe invoke a siege, maybe just keep lobbing artillery in in the hopes that that Ukrainians will capitulate. 
They've established the land bridge between Crimea and the Donbass so they can begin to either cut off Ukrainian forces fighting in the east or force them to cede the territory in order to go protect Kiev, which would be a very hard decision for the president to make to cede that part of the country. I could see circumstances in which Russia attempts to lay siege to Ukrainian cities and other countries try and airdrop supplies into them, you know, as sort of a Berlin airlift kind of as a humanitarian gesture. And again, these things get, as you, of course, know better than I, these things get very fraught very fast. Um, but it is it is hard for me to see how the Russians accept defeat rather than escalate, become more barbaric, begin to just level cities the way they did in Chechnya mm-hmm. in order to conquer the country. That, that, that a lot of I unfortunately hear that opinion often, and I hope you're wrong uh, because it's 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 genocide at that point if it's not already. Uh, some of the stories we're hearing: um, Congresswoman Victoria Sparks from Indiana, she's Ukrainian born, and um, and that's her homeland. She she has a lot of family there, and she gave she's gave some, some pretty harrowing accounts of what's going on with civilians right now. Uh, she said there's reports of, you know, women and children, civilians, villagers being taken out, put in front of Russian tanks, sometimes run over and other times just put there as human shields when they invade the next village. And uh, that, that, that's the kind of thing we're hearing. Um, so, you know, it's it, it's I, I unfortunately I think you're right. Whether here's another question, though, Putin. Putin starts to lose and he gets more barbaric, right? He, 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 he starts this sort of scorched earth policy. Um, it's a little different than Chechnya, though, because the world wasn't watching that the way they can watch this. Right. And so right. and, and it's just, they didn't come together over it. You know, it's, it's, it's just different um, for whatever reason, right or wrong. It's just different. And, um, and it's not all it's also not clear. Right? There was always a conflict between Chechnyans and, and Russians. It's not really a, you know, you, Ukrainians don't don't send suicide bombers into Russia, you know, right. so so they, the, the justification isn't there. It does seem to me Russian Russian soldiers, Russian civilians. Again, it's like it's like us versus Canada. Like, how can you I don't think they're they're, they're still people. They're still human beings and they don't necessarily buy into yeah. this madness. So I wonder I that's, that's my a, that's my hopeful counter argument. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to that. We are already seeing. Uh, for example, the videos of Russian armored columns stopped by civilians standing in front of them. That's incredibly beautiful and incredibly brave. The Russians could run them over and mostly have not been. And either their rules of engagement are to avoid civilian casualties, or I think more likely, Russian soldiers are choosing not to complete the mission because they don't want to do what's required. And it's exactly your point about, you know, they're not, you always have to have consent that soldiers are really willing to do those things and and run those risks in order to achieve what you want. And it doesn't look to me like Russian soldiers are willing to. There are some reports today um, out of Ukraine that a Russian amphibious landing was within, you know, 70 nautical miles of Odessa and turned around and they suspect that the Russians were unwilling to carry out their orders. And I, 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 it would be a beautiful outcome if we saw a lot of that. That as, would be great. I, I, I heard about, I've also heard that Russians, again, this goes back to the military capabilities that they just don't have, you know, they, they don't have the ability to do mine clearance, for instance. Like you, you put some mines in the water around Odessa and they're, you know, they're screwed. Um, so it, I've, I've, heard that as well like any because they've been unopposed in their landing so far an op- an opposed landing yeah. would be very they, they couldn't deal with it and again it's a matter of like, could they deal with it yeah look if you really care you'll go like on d-day they went but this ain't yeah. d-day you know this this isn't this isn't fighting for your freedom yeah. you're fighting to kill your neighbors that's crazy yeah and i think the point you made early on in this conversation um is really really consequential which is that you know, the Russians haven't fought any good military. 
-hmm. They fought the Chechens. Uh, they fought uh, Syrians. Uh, they fought, you know, the couple of couple of skirmishes between U.S. forces in Syria and the Russians. Mm -hmm. We braced them up very quickly. Yeah. And so, you know, the Ukrainian military has been getting a lot of training and a lot of help since 2014, and it really shows in their professionalism. And, you know, we are partisans in this. We're feeding them intelligence. We're feeding them arms. All the NATO countries are. And so they're getting really high-priced help mm -hmm. to help them do the best that they can against the Russians. And it's to our credit, but it's mostly to their credit. Let, let, let's end the conversation with that. What more can we do um, realistically? Is there, uh, do, do you see any gaps in how we're getting lethal aid uh, to them? Any, any gaps in, in willpower at this point um, or supplies? Uh, and on the sanctions front as well is, um, look, I mean, that's a, it's, it, it becomes this double-edged sword because of, because of Europe's dependence on oil and gas from Russia. Um, which is why some of these sanctions have not been as far as they can be. But what's your opinion on that and what, what we should be looking at over the next week or so? Yeah, so uh, I think at some point the Russians are going to uh, try and interdict the arms shipments that we and others are sending Ukrainians. Mm. And that will be a real test whether when the Russians attack the shipments, we're still willing to do it and we're willing to protect the arms that the arms shipments that we're sending. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a really important potential weakness. And we and everybody else helping the Ukrainians ought to brace ourselves for that challenge and try and be as brave as Ukrainians are being. Yeah. Um, I don't see your point about the sanctions is a good one. Sanctions tend not to work very forcibly in the near term. Right. But the ruble did lose 25% of its value. I was so pleased to see that the consortium building Nord Stream 2 went bankrupt today. It's now insolvent. Right. Um, and that the Biden administration released oil from the strategic reserve. Mm -hmm. um, one big gap is the UAE and Saudi Arabia and other oil producers yeah. not helping keep the spiking price of oil down by releasing more oil. What, what is their think, problem? Why, why aren't they doing that? I don't have a good answer to that, but it's a really bad look for countries that rely on the United States for their security it to is. refuse to be helpful. It is. Is our administration doing enough to pressure them? I mean, we've got a lot of leverage over Saudi yeah. and UAE. I don't know the answer to that. That would be a great thing for Congress to drag the administration up to testify about. Right. I mean, look, it, 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 this, this, this formula isn't that hard. It's a supply demand problem. Um, Russia has right. too much supply for all the demand around the world. The demand will not change. You know, this, this is something Democrats just don't understand. They think they think you can change demand. You can't. <laughs> to, to global demand stays right. the same. They think we can just go to solar and wind and everything's going to be great. It's just not true. Um, and so you, you have to reduce Russia's market share so that you have more leverage over them in times like this. Again, I, I, I agree with you. You, you kind of made the point, um, but I'll state it again, which is the sanctions aren't going to stop the war. The only thing that stops the war is more bullets and bombs. That will that will stop the war. Um, sanctions will maybe prevent further war um, and, and, and send a message to China, but they're not going to prevent this war. Um, that being said, you got to do both. You gotta, you gotta Absolutely. Put... You got to use all the all the levers available to us to try and persuade the Russians to stop doing this and to punish them if they don't do it. I was delighted that as part of the German chancellor, again, this is a social democratic German chancellor in a coalition with the Green Party um, that agreed to immediately start building two LNG terminals so that they end their reliance on Russian energy. That's a huge change in attitude. Yeah, I didn't hear that because I know they've been canceling them constantly. Um, you know, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of famous examples of this. Uh, the French doing the same thing, claiming that our LNG is dirt too dirty, doesn't meet their, meet their standards or something about whatever, and then they import Russian gas. So it's it's steeply sad that it, it 
took a war to get Europe to this point where they understand that we're your friends and you should be buying our oil and gas and American energy dominance keeps the world safe. Um, climate change isn't killing Ukrainian civilians. The Russians are. <laughs> so, right. you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a, lot, a lot of naivete, I think, has at least been people have been disabused of. You know, one other point you raised earlier that I really want to underscore, because I think it's consequential, is that the Chinese are learning from what they're seeing. And one of the things they are learning is that the, the West can be shaken out of its torpor and take action when you shock their conscience. Um, and that's what the invasion of Taiwan would do as well. And one of the things I hope, one positive outcome of the grief Ukrainians are suffering on all of our behalf would be all of us thinking carefully about the much bigger risks China poses for the global economy and for our security. And before China invades Taiwan or anyone else, uh, separating out strategic parts of the economy, making sure we are not unduly reliant on China, making sure our technology companies aren't compromised by China, mm -hmm. all of those important things that we are doing on the fly now with Russia, we can do as prior planning right. for handling China. And uh, and I hope there's some political will to do that. I, I think there is. There's definitely disagreement on how to get there. My biggest problem with Democrats right now is they, they will not acknowledge the energy question. They just won't acknowledge it. They continue along that path. And um, that's dangerous. But we probably will have the House in 2022 and can, can push that agenda. A little bit better um, on that happy note. Well, um, Corey, thanks so much for, for being on. This has been great and very informative for our listeners. Really appreciate your expertise. It was a real pleasure, Congressman. Thanks for having me. Of course.